thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity <coughs> to speak to this uh, important conference. I'm going to say a few words about oil and <coughs> the oil industry. It's, uh, excuse me, it's a complicated, uh, complex uh, industry with a complex history, uh, deeply embedded in, in, in some of Canada's psyche in various ways and deeply embedded in Canadian uh, both federal and uh, provincial policies. Uh, and of course, of an industry that is dominated by some <clears throat> some very big players. Uh, let me just say that um, the to some extent, the oil industry is facing a new situation in relation to uh, the people of Canada. It's been around for a very long time, as you know, oil industry going back to Alberta in the uh, the uh, immediately post-war period. The oil industry kind of flew under the radar as far as, as, far as extractive industries and the difficulties and problems that were confronted by the uh, citizens and communities. Uh, the oil industry tended to be kind of localized in terms of its impacts. Uh, people, uh, First Nations lands were affected, uh, local community lands, farmers' lands were affected. Uh, but there was no larger mass of objection to that brought people together and brought these linkages that we heard talked about for very, very many years in the oil industry. Um, these were localized uh, issues, localized challenges, people, many people very passionately fighting the oil industry on farms and, and on First Nation reserves and other, uh, some other local communities. But generally speaking, uh, it, there was no larger connecting uh, force uh, that the oil industry had to face. And so the oil industry is um, really today going through a transition in the environment which, within which it functions. And it is coming to, one may think, uh, one may suspect just by some of the things you see, it's coming to a belated realization uh, that it has a problem. The oil industry has a big problem. Uh, and while mining and some other extractive industries <coughs> were always considered to be a little bit suspect uh, in, in numerous ways, and you're gonna hear all about that, the oil industry uh, now realizes that, uh, that it too is not only suspect, but that there are some really, really major challenges that people are coming to see and understand and want to, uh, and, and want to have answered. Uh, and it's, it's conferences like this and sessions like this that are going to help us uh, try to ensure that the oil industry does have to answer for its behavior. Um, just might note that uh, the Canadian oil industry is a significant industry. We have the uh, second or thir third largest, I guess, now proven reserves of oil uh, in the world. Uh, this, is, uh, this means we have a lot of oil. We have about 200 years of reserves of oil to, if we were just based it on meeting our own domestic needs. But, of course, we export. Um, and it's just a bit complicated. I won't get into it in any great detail, but uh, oil is produced in Western Canada and Newfoundland, and we have refineries in Eastern Canada. So one of the things that happens based on transportation and so on is Western Canadian oil is consumed some here. Uh, the rest goes down to the United States, is exported to the United States. Uh, in Eastern Canada, Canada and the refineries there, this is largely the case, there's some movement within this, but in Eastern Canada, uh, Newfoundland oil fields are supplying uh, refineries and then there's imported oil coming into Eastern Canada. So we're both an importer and an exporter. Uh, second thing is oil production has increased fairly substantially over the last, uh, 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 well, few years uh, and is continuing to increase. Uh, the sole reason for, well, almost the sole reason for that is the tar sands. The, the, all the growth in oil production is largely coming from the tar, sand, tar sands. There's a bit of expansion in Saskatchewan to do with the Bakken uh, deposits, which you, you've heard about uh, North Dakota and the big boom that's happening there. Some of that's happening in Saskatchewan, but <clears throat> that will be much more sh <clears throat> short-lived, excuse me, than the oil sands, which are, uh, once the oil sands are developed, they're, uh, they're with us, they're here to stay for a very, very long time, and that's one of the things we really need to worry about. These wells in Saskatchewan, they'll have a fairly short life. They're bringing a little bit of a boom there, they, and, but they'll, they, will, uh, they will run out of, of production capacity. Uh, let me just say a word about uh, oil, oil and the market environment in which the oil industry works. Uh, we, we're all very much aware of the rapid and dr dramatic price de decline in the price of oil over the last six months or so. Uh, and this is, of course, the talk of Alberta, the talk of the country. Uh, what does this, all this mean? I just want to make this observation that oil doesn't, the oil markets don't function like we might, <coughs> might think of, <coughs> you know, sort of more ordinary markets, the market for grain or, <coughs> excuse me, or something like that. Uh, the oil market is subject to these things we call shocks, unexpected shocks, so, uh, un an unplanned shock. So we get, uh, things like uh, uh, global events come along. Uh, we all know about the, the various times where wars in the Middle East or con conflicts in the Middle East cause the price of oil to shoot up. 
uh, then it may stabilize down again. Uh, we know that uh, there's a, a political organization, a quasi-political organization called OPEC, which uh, has tried to influence the price of oil to keep it up by, uh, by ma managing supply. Uh, so supply management exists in this sector. Uh, it also is uh, uh, subject to changes in technology and production. So we've seen, for instance, the United States, which uh, until very, uh, till very recently was thought to be an ever-growing uh, importer of oil and dependent upon oil, including from Canada, is switching very quickly to becoming oil self-sufficient. It's not quite there, it's not there yet, but because of the fracking and the new sources, the new technologies in terms of uh, 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 reaping oil, uh, uh, taking, uh, 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 pumping oil, uh, they're extracting oil, <coughs> there's a big change. So these markets are, are very changeable and they change in sudden, sudden leaps uh, and, uh, and it's quite unexpected in, in many cases. People are very, very bad, economists are bad at predicting any prices, but they're very bad at predicting <coughs> what's going to happen in the oil market. Uh, what we've seen in Canada raises all kinds of questions and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good natural experiment when the price of oil goes from 100 and some dollars a barrel down to 40 some dollars a barrel, rather, we could argue about exactly where you calculate the price, uh, you know, all kinds of things become obvious, but secondly, all kinds of questions start to be asked. Uh, how did we get so dependent, and we, we have become very dependent, how did we get so dependent on a commodity uh, which, for which we could experience such dramatic shifts in prices, and why were there no uh, considerations given to this possibility? Uh, and it seems that the government planning, the industry planning, no one seemed to be realistically considering pricing scenarios. This is not that hard to do. Uh, you just put different probabilities on pricing outcomes and do use some, uh, so use some uh, simple arithmetic and mathematics, and you can you can uh, you can do some planning. But it wasn't done. Everything was done as if the price was going to keep running up since it started increasing in the uh, early 2000s, uh, and then we've seen what happened. Uh, these these effects are, are going to be fairly dramatic, and uh, and it, there's no question about that. Um, well, how important is this industry to our, uh, to our economy? Well, basically, uh, oil, the oil sector contributes about 2% of our GDP. Uh, you'd think it was much, much larger from some of the discussion that you hear. It's about 2%. Uh, you can argue about the numbers. There's some spin-off effects, particularly when we have a downturn. You get some of these spin-off effects, unemployment in, in contracting industries and so on, which are outside of these numbers. But it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a, you know, it's a decent size industry, 2%, but that's not huge of, of our gross domestic product. That's a, what we produce in this country. Uh, employment is, uh, employment's in the range of maybe 60,000 people or something like this in the oil industry. This is not huge, there's 14 million people uh, uh, working in Canada. Uh, so the claims about the size of the oil industry and how important it is because of the jobs and the economy uh, are, uh, well, uh, the, the kind of claims that are made by the industry and government are, are, are an exaggeration and this is something we found, which I'll talk about a little bit in our report, uh, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, another thing I just want to make a point about is understanding the oil industry and what the oil industry has done to Canada. Uh, some of you have heard the term Dutch disease. Um, about four years ago I gave a talk over at Woodward's on the Dutch disease and the contribution of the oil industry to this and a couple of a few other people started talking about this and we were just completely uh, uh, discredited by the media and by government and so on. They, they simply you know, made us out to be completely unrealistic, unreal silly, stupid, making up stories that were just uh, uh, to undermine the Western Canadian oil industry and the Western Canadian position that had been strengthened. And by the way, the oil story is also part of this, Alberta and Saskatchewan and the West are back in and now we've got power. There's a lot of narratives that go with this. Um, and uh, the, the, the Dutch disease is, 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 is what's attributed to when you have a product like oil, a commodity like oil, a single commodity, runs up prices, prices go very high, um, and exports grow at a, in a market that's gone through a, 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 short ter a fairly short term a jump in demand. Uh, this drives out manufacturing industry. I won't get into the, all the details of the adjustment within the economy, but manufacturing goods become much more, more expensive, labor becomes more expensive, uh, you get more uh, migration of labor across the country, and it essentially drives out the more traditional, long-term, stable, sustainable manufacturing industries. And this has happened in Canada, uh, and it, it, most people now, most economists are, are beginning to acknowledge this, and it, it's created many, many challenges for us in how to move forward in terms of maintaining and, and sustaining our manufacturing industry. Um, 
One of the things that's said about oil is it contributes uh, tremendously to, to provincial and federal revenues, and that is true. If oil is by its nature, uh, we collect rents from it, there, it creates royalties, it has a surplus that's created in value, some of that goes to government uh, through the collection of, of uh, 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 royalties and, and taxes, uh, and these numbers are fairly significant. Uh, but there's another side to this, and that is that you know a good tax source is one that's not only substantial but that's stable. Uh, and when you see what's happened with uh, oil-dependent uh, uh, economies, like uh, well, to some degree the Canadian one now, which has become more uh, oil-dependent, but the Alberta economy, look what happens, and look what happens to society when oil collapses. This is not a, uh, a classic sustainable sector, even in terms of just the royalty, the revenues, and so that, so on that come from it. Uh, now, can't talk about oil in Canada without talking about the tar sands. So all of our, we, we produce uh, about uh, two and a half uh, million barrels a day, uh, three and a half million barrels a day of uh, oil in Canada. About one million of that comes from what's called conventional oil. The rest is all coming from tar sands. All of the growth in Canada in the future is going to come from tar sands. Uh, Tarzans is a manufacturing and a mining and manufacturing process. It's completely different from what we've done in the past with oil, and it also produces dirty oil. It is there is no question that bitumen. Uh, the reason that tankers blow up and explode is because it's bitumen. The, peop the reason that uh, uh, transportation disasters and pipeline disasters are going to be as bad as they are is because it's bitumen. So we have we are going to have to. We are beginning to acknowledge, acknowledge here that this Tarzan development is a serious extractive issue. Now, I don't need to go into all the problems that arise from, uh, you, so you'll hear more about, you know more about the Tarzans, you'll hear more about it. Uh, but uh, we in BC know that not only do we have all of these environmental and, uh, and, uh, 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 and land and resource impacts in the, uh, in the areas of Alberta where the Tarzans are existed, but of course, pipelines, shipping this oil has become so important because uh, that we just simply don't need this oil in Canada. We're not, we don't need this for our own industry. So the, the secret is to export. Well, we were taking oil south. It's not going to go south to any great extent. There'll be some exchange. This Keystone line would probably, if it's built, carry, it will carry some oil, but it'll just be some reshifting oil around the continent. But the big place the industry has to look for is to shipments, ex world, global shipments. And the place they want to go come the place they want to do it is in BC. Uh, this takes me to, uh, I wish I had more time to talk about the industry, but this takes me into some comments about this industry. Uh, I had an opportunity, we took an opportunity, I shouldn't say it had, we took an opportunity to uh, review uh, the work that was being done on the Kinder Morgan pipeline, which is to ex export uh, Tarzan's oil to the, down to Vancouver and ship it out, as I mentioned, through tankers out, the, out of the harbor. Um, we wanted to just do a kind of fact checking. A group of us wanted to do some fact checking. We didn't. We didn't have any particularly loaded agenda with respect to what what uh, uh, Kinder Morgan was claiming about the pipeline. We had a great deal of concerns, shared great deal of concerns with others about the environmental impacts. But we decided to do a look at the impacts, benefits, and costs that the Kinder Morgan pipeline is going to uh, uh, have for BC compared to, and look at what Kinder Morgan had claimed. And we found out something here that I think is uh, worth noting in a conference like this. We found that Kinder Morgan deliberately, well, deliberately, uh, maybe, uh, I, can't, well, I, can't I can't necessarily say what their intent was, but let's say this. The fact of the matter was, is that the numbers they present on job creation, on economic benefits, are, are, are vastly exaggerated. And the numbers they present with respect to uh, uh, the costs of, uh, of uh, spills are severely underrepresented by a very, very wide, wide margin. The methodologies they use are uh, deeply suspect and should not uh, sh sh should simply not be part of the way we assess these these projects. And yet, we are we are looking at these projects and assessing these projects largely through the regulators, largely through the numbers that are presented by the oil industry. And in the past, you know, we've kind of had a social contract in Canada where these environmental assessments and project assessments uh, depended on the industry to provide a a honest answers. Uh, we're not getting that now from, from this industry. Something has changed in the sense of the, re of, the, of the view this industry has about how it can treat its government and its regulators. Now, why is that so? You're going to talk about that and speculate about that. But two things I, I just want to note in, in, in closing. I have a whole bunch of other things here to say, but uh, time is, is sort of short. Um, the, the first is, um, 
uh, we are seeing uh, a serious deterioration, a serious undermining, a serious decline in the quality and substance of our analysis and review of these projects, uh, which all of, uh, all of them require huge amounts of commitment of public infrastructure, huge utilization of our resources, huge impacts on our environment, whatever, any of the oil and, and tra oil transport developments from here on in are going to have massive impacts. What we are finding is the assessment process, the way that regulators and governments assess these things has declined uh, to, to, in, in terms of its substance and its integrity to such a degree as we're not really getting honest assessments anymore. That's something we should think about because this is a place that we do have opportunity to pay, have checks and balances with government. Uh, second thing I mentioned, the oil industry is facing, is facing uh, realizes it's facing uh, 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 some difficulties with Canadians. But uh, I want to just caution you about, or uh, say something about corporate cultures. Uh, what I've seen in the oil industry, and I've watched the oil industry and studied the oil industry for very, very many years, the culture of the oil, oil industry has now become one of uh, a, a bully culture, a, a, a antagonistic culture to the people, a disregard to the people, a belief that uh, governments uh, are just getting in the way, uh, environmentalists are getting in the way, people who do ser serious academic and other research are getting in the way. Uh, it has become a hostile, uh, nasty, uh, 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 non-cooperative culture within the, uh, uh, the, the oil industry. And this, uh, this, this uh, well, it's just something we need to understand and realize and uh, think about in terms of how we deal with this industry. Uh, the, the, the last thing is I wanted to mention about the environment the industry works in, and I don't have to go into this in any great detail with you, but we do have a policy environment now where the oil industry is largely become part of the political culture that the uh, party in power and the governing, uh, the governing elites have attached themselves to. It is, it is amazing how much over the last eight to 10 years, media, academics, uh, researchers, think tanks, government, uh, business, labor, have become attached to this aisle, the idea that the oil industry is an industry that creates us opportunities for great new wealth and great new uh, 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 financial advantage in supporting our governments and so on. And so we've, we've incorporated a, a, an environment where the oil industry gets very favorable treatment from government, both the federal and provincial level. Uh, and uh, it's also governments have shown that they, they, they mistrust people, was mentioned, you know, we're under suspicion if we raise questions. Any of us have been involved, got involved in this fight. Many of us know that we end up on lists, and uh, and 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 this is a, and this is a direct result of the linking together of what's the national interest of the government with this particular oil interest, and this is poisonous. It creates a, it creates a, 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 an environment of mistrust, of uh, suspicion, suspicion of each other, uh, of corruption, uh, government corruption, and other things that have gone with these petro states we've seen before. And, and so I just caution and warn, uh, warn all of us that we need to be on the watch out for how far this oil industry um, is reaching into our society through our governments and, 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 and through its own actions. I'll close there. Thank you. I just to give you a little bit of background about me is I used to work for the Council of Canadians um, based in BC and it was through that work that I got a lot of exposure to working on fracking and LNG. How many people just raise your hand know what LNG is? All right, <laughs> pretty awesome. Usually I do presentations, I have to explain it. I'm still gonna explain it if anybody was too shy to raise their hand because they didn't think they wanted people to know that. But uh, liquefied natural gas, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about LNG. And uh, what it should be called is liquefied fracked gas. And when the government started trying to push this project onto communities, they got pretty savvy and they said, you know, people don't like fracking because we've been hearing about fracking for a while. There's countries coming out against it. There's communities coming out against it. So maybe we'll try to call it something natural sounding like liquefied natural gas. And so if you ever kind of bring this up with industry, they get really worked up if you try to say LFG or liquefied frack gas, but you can't really talk about LNG unless you talk about fracking. And so when it comes to BC, we are going gangbusters on the fracking. There's no eloquent way to say that. It's been going on for many, many decades. In the northeast portion of BC, what is known as Treaty A territory, Fort St. John, Fort Nelson area, 
Um, and that's been going on for a while, and we're seeing huge impacts in Treaty 8 territory um, as a result of fracking, which is basically when we start running out of easy to find natural gas, industry comes up with more um, destructive and extreme forms of getting at what is left, and that's looking into kind of shale gas. So they basically have to pump chemicals down, or sorry, yeah, pump, pump a mix of chemicals and sand and water down deep, really high pressure, bust up these shales seems to kind of pull out the gas. And in doing so, they're not only destroying huge amounts of kind of fresh water and clean water that they're kind of pulling out of rivers and out of underground aquifers, they're kind of taking that water and then using it to pull out this really destructive form of energy that's really high in methane. And so whenever Chrissy Clark comes walking around and saying that, you know, LNG is really good when it comes to climate change, she's lying, of course, as you probably all know, because if it's coming from fracking and fracking has, it's basically, very high, when we look at fracking, we look at the amount of methane that's created and released, and methane is a way more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. It's about 20, it's 86 times more potent over 20 years. And so you look at that piece of the equation, and you look at LNG in total, and we're, you, we're kind of looking at a huge um, driver of climate change if we go forward. So we start with the fracking, huge uses of water up in the northeastern portion of BC, um, destroying that water, it can't be put back into the hydrological cycle. And the industry up there is really, really doing their best to find whatever water they can. Because in the beginning they were pulling water out of the rivers, and then there was a year where there was a drought. And the government actually said to the farmers up in the Peace region that you can't pull water, but we're gonna let industry pull water for the fracking. And that got a lot of people really angry. So then industry said, oh, why don't we find underground sources of water that no one knows about, and we can kind of pull it all secret-like, and then they won't know. And so that kind of pushed a big kind of gold rush on water up in northeastern BC. Um, and so that's a huge issue. In 2012 alone, there was, I think, 7 billion liters of water that was used for fracking. And it's probably just gone up since then. Um, and then, again, as I said, the water cannot be returned because it's full of chemicals and carcinogenic chemicals, chemicals that cause a huge range of health impacts. Fracking also in the northeastern part of BC causes um, fragmentation, destruction to the habitat, and, and air pollution, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so we start there, and what's really interesting about BC is when fracking first started happening, there was impacted communities at kind of where it was happening, at Ground Zero, who started saying, we need to do something about this, because this is destroying our land, it's destroying our water and our health. And a lot of environmental groups didn't pay attention because they didn't want to work on it. They thought it would be too difficult to win. And they turned a blind eye. And now people are starting to pay attention because if you don't deal with something at the source, it starts to come to where you are. We look at the tar sands, we notice that same thing with fracking. Now because we didn't do um, enough diligence of supporting folks in the beginning of actually fighting this when it was really impacting um, in Treaty 8 territory, we're seeing pipelines and we're seeing what we call liquefied natural gas terminals being proposed at a huge rate and an unprecedented quickness, I would say. So when I started working at the Council of Canadians, that was less than a year ago, maybe, yeah, it was about a year ago, there was 12 liquefied natural gas terminals that were proposed, and now it's up to 18. That's a lot of liquefied natural gas terminals. Um, pipelines, we're looking at dozens of frack gas pipelines um, that would take that gas that's being fracked up in northeastern BC and then move it across the province to um, northern, kind of the northwest, kind of Prince Rupert Kitimat area, and then also down south to LNG terminals that are proposed in Squamish, um, as well as Delta Richmond area and uh, Vancouver Island, Campbell River and Sarita Bay. So again, People weren't really paying attention to LNG and then it started to come closer and closer and closer to the places that we all call home, right? Um, a few things, just so people kind of understand LNG, is you take that fracked gas and then you ship it via pipeline. Once it gets to the terminal, you have to supercool it to be about minus 163 degrees. That takes a huge amount of energy to do that. And then you're gonna basically load it onto these massive super tankers. Um, these super tankers, some of the biggest ones in the world, are the size of three football fields. Um, and again, it's really interesting that a lot of people have gotten really worked up about tar sands tankers, but are kind of not as concerned about LNG tankers. And one of the reasons for that is when government and industry was going to communities and trying to sell LNG, and they were saying to people that they have a choice, you know, they're like, you know, you've already said no to the tar sands pipelines, but you know, natural gas, it's good for you, it's clean, you know, you can't say no to everything. And if there's ever a spill, it'll probably evaporate in form of rainbow. And we all like rainbows, especially on the coast. Um, and so people were, you know, they, they kind of bought that to a certain degree. And what people have been finding out when you start digging into it is that if there ever is an accident with an LNG tanker, 
It is not a situation you want to even be near in any way, shape, or form. So what you have is these massive tankers uh, with huge amounts of super-cooled liquefied natural gas. If they were to get um, a collision or, or a leak of some sort, the gas would not evaporate into the air because it's very, very, very cold. So what it would do is it would actually form kind of a vapor, a low fog, that would kind of run along the water. And if it caught any kind of spark or anything like that, it would light up in a massive explosion. And this is a big deal, because when I say mass explosion, I mean fireball of death. <laughs> Not to be a fear monger, but that's, I'm actually <laughs> decreasing that, because when you actually read the fine print, it's worse than a fireball of death. So the thing with that is, you look at a lot of um, countries that have been doing LNG, and it's been going on for decades. Not in Canada, though. And there hasn't been an accident yet with an LNG tanker. Doesn't mean there can't be, and you don't want to be the first place where that happens. You look at a lot of the projects that are being proposed for Canada, and the people who are proposing them, the companies, have very little experience in LNG, if any. Um, there's an association of LNG tanker and terminal operators, and it's a list of pretty shady companies and corporations, but even they come out and they say that if you're ever going to put an LNG anywhere, tankers and terminal, you don't put it in narrow inland waterways, you don't put it in your big population centers. So when you look at places like Squamish and Howe Sound, where they're proposing the wood fiber LNG terminal, you look at Delta, and you realize that if there is any kind of accident with any of these tankers, you're putting huge amounts of, I guess, people's lives at risk. And that is a reason why there's been a lot of community groups in kind of the Squamish area who have been going around to different councils and communities along my sea to sky and also West Vancouver and getting councils to kind of sign off a resolution saying we don't want these tankers in our waters because they put us at risk. And that is a huge issue and a risk that we have to really think about, um, especially for the folks in Delta, because they're really, really close. So that's something I, I get nervous about. Um, also want to say that if we go ahead with even five of these LNG terminals in BC, not the 18 the government wants to see, but even anywhere from three to five, we're gonna end up with this, about three quarters of the greenhouse gas emissions as the Alberta tar sands. And everybody knows that the tar sands is not an environmentally friendly project. Um, when I started doing environmental organizing about a decade ago, that's what I was working on because I'm from Alberta. And it's a heartbreaking thing to see that in the last 10 years, they just keep destroying the land and they just keep trying to grow, right? Um, so LNG, not good for the greenhouse gas. Um, another thing that people, I actually prefer talking about water and, and safety than greenhouse gases because I'm from Alberta and usually when you bring up climate change people leave the room. So uh, I want to mention salmon because salmon's a big one when it comes to LNG. So I don't know if people have heard about um, the Skeena Estuary. Do people know where that is? Yeah. Some people, yeah. Um, if you go up in northern BC, northwestern BC, you have the mighty Skeena River um, and the Skeena River kind of empties out where it kind of hits the ocean, you have a beautiful estuary. And it's where the salmon kind of go from fresh water, they get their time to transition and get strong before they enter into the sea. Um, the Skeena River has basically the second largest wild salmon run that's still going. And people in that area have depended on that since time immemorial for food um, and for so many things. And in Northwestern BC, again, a lot of communities were taking a more quiet stance with LNG because they didn't want to rock the boat. They felt they'd already said no to the tar sands pipelines and you know, they were being sold the jobs because that's what the government always says is you're going to get so many jobs from this. But then when they found out that there was two LNG terminals proposed in the Skeena estuary and folks started to do their research, that's when you start to see a bit more um, folks coming out saying this is a problem. So there's two companies, um, or sorry, two conglomerates um, that are forming kind of uh, proposals in the Skeena estuary around putting two LNG terminals. And if they put these terminals there, there's been a study that actually came out from SFU that said it could sink the Skeena salmon run because it's in such a sensitive area. And that's created a lot of, I think, opposition in the north um, and, and kind of built on that because salmon are important and once they're gone, they're gone. And we look at things like the Mount Pauly mine disaster impacting the Fraser and now we're gonna move on to places like the Skeena as well. So that's a big one. Same in how sound with the wood fiber LNG. How Sound has basically been um, recovering these last few decades from a huge amount of pollution. And for the first time, people are starting to talk about the herring coming back and the whales coming back and the salmon coming back. And to put these massive super tankers and an LNG terminal right in the Sound would put all of that at risk. 
One thing they do to cool this gas is they have to pull the seawater into the plant in huge volumes, and that kind of ends up heating up the seawater, and then they also add chlorine to it when they return it to the, the sea because they're trying to make sure their pipes stay clean. And the wood fiber company keeps saying that this will be fine to house sound. We're just adding a little bit of chlorine like your swimming pool, and uh, that will be a problem. So you got to think about the safety of the water as well. I think finally I'm just going to say, well, I have a few more things to say. Um, our government, I mean, I want to call it our government because I think a lot of us probably didn't vote for them. Um, but Christy Clark has been going around and selling LNG like nobody's business. Incredibly pushing it hard, hard, hard. And even going after children, high schools, youth, um, really pushing that. There was, uh, they teamed up with Science World here in Vancouver to go on these propaganda tours where they basically had high schools and, and folks coming down and all the kids left with a little thumb drive full of LNG propaganda. And they were being told in there that you know, you're gonna get jobs that are 90 grand a year, aren't you lucky? And I think when we look at LNG and jobs, and so one of those promises that the Premier keeps saying that is vaporizing and they keep promising jobs, folks are not qualified necessarily to get them, they're signing contracts where they're gonna be giving those jobs away. And, and I think a lot of communities in the north are starting to see that. Um, you look at a place like Wood Fiber and they're promising at max in the long term 100 jobs, let's say, for that community for that plant. How many people are qualified to actually do that work, we're not sure. But if you look at uh, a gondola that they recently opened, that's also 100 jobs. And they didn't have to destroy the environment, risk their air, their safety, and their water to do it. So I think a lot of people would like to see something different and would like the government to be pushing uh, a different kind of alternative. Um, I also want to acknowledge that there have been um, communities of land defenders who've been standing up to kind of fracked gas and fracking and LNG far before any of us even knew about it and, and we're getting concerned about it and they truly sounded the alarm on this. And you guys are gonna be hearing from some of those folks during the rest of the weekend, um, such as the Unistoten camp. Tagesta and Frida are gonna be speaking and they're amazing. Um, and if people don't know, um, they will tell you more about their work, but basically, they are part of the Wet'suwet'en uh, First Nation, and it is their kind of the territory of their clan that has several pipelines running through it, um, being not just the Enbridge Pipeline, but also the Pacific Trails Fracked Gas Pipeline and Coastal Gas Link Pipeline. And these are two fracked gas pipelines, and they've been having an ongoing blockade for about five years plus to those fracked gas pipelines before anybody else was kind of willing to step up and do it. So that's something that's really amazing. And then also, Maddie Lee is another uh, land defender camp that started up in Gitsan territory by three hereditary chiefs, and they're blocking um, the Trans-Canada frac gas pipeline that would feed one of the LNG terminals in the Skeena estuary. So there's a lot of folks who have been standing up. And then, I know, it's awesome. Um, and then on Sunday, I don't want to pull anything away from the conference, because I know you guys have a full agenda on Sunday. But on Sunday, up in Squamish, uh, Squamish Action, which is a community group in the Squamish First Nation, they are gonna be putting on a protest against the wood fiber LNG led by the women of the Squamish Nation. And if you wanna go up there in solidarity with them, it's at noon in Nexon Beach, and they would love it. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Thanks. Um, it's really good to, to be here and have a chance to, to listen uh, to everybody else on the panel, hear a little bit more about the other extractive sectors in this country. I spend a lot of time very focused on hard rock mining and I think it's really important that we're putting these different pieces together. Um, I think maybe something that's a little bit different about Canada's um, hard rock mining sector is how globalized it is. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, first, um, just the size of the sector and what that model is that, that we've created here at home that we're now exporting abroad, and then try to talk a little bit about um, where things are at in terms of uh, Canadian mining uh, around the world and the framework um, that facilitates it and ensures that the many abuses connected with it remain in impunity, and then try to wind up with some of the ways in which peoples are resisting um, around the world and ever more vigorously, despite the tremendous risks that they run. Um, I think as it was mentioned right off the top, 
that Canada is home to some 75% of the world's mining uh, corporations. Um, principally, we've got some 1,500 plus mining companies that list on Toronto stock exchanges. It's important to know um, that of those 1,500 companies, which have over 8,000 projects, um, only nine, about 90% of those are, are speculating, don't have an operating mine anywhere. Um, some of them might be actually carrying out uh, exploration, uh, prospecting work, uh, dirty work to try to uh, divide and conquer in communities. Um, but there's also lots that are just raising funds on the stock exchange and not doing much at all. About 10% of them actually have operating mines. Um, of those 8,000 projects, about half of them are found uh, scattered across the country. Um, Canada provides tremendous tax incentives to facilitate mining exploration uh, here at home and, and, and really has, has built the country on quite a sort of colonial model considering that mining is one of the highest uses of land and facilitating free entry uh, for prospectors regardless of whose land, whose home, whose water uh, those they are entering onto. Um, I think maybe here at home you've, you've had a very uh, potent illustration of what hard rock mining is with the Mount Polly disaster that took place in August of this year. I don't think I have to go into too much detail about what that looks like um, when in early August you all saw, I presume you all saw, the, the video footage of a five kilometer perimeter uh, tailings dam full of toxic uh, sands that, had, that are the result of, uh, you know, having dug up tons and tons of, of rock which is ground up to remove the low concentrations of minerals that mining companies are, are, are looking for these days and that are then disposed of and that create these mega toxic waste dumps on people's lives and uh, lands and territories that they have to live with and forever. And you saw this uh, large tailings dam uh, suddenly burst uh, and destroy 10 kilometers of, of river and uh, entering into the, the, the Kesno Lake um, and that is going to have repercussions for a long, long time. And just to note how, how these disasters um, around the same time that this was happening in, in, in BC there was, there was a massive uh, disaster as well in, in Mexico, similar disasters in, in, in Bolivia, and how these are really um, the result of, of corporate greed colliding with both poor design, poor oversight, and how it really constantly over and over are the local people and places that are paying with their lives, with their water, with their landscapes, with their fisheries, um, with their, their sense of enjoyment and, and health on the land. And with all the time that they have to put into fighting and fighting and fighting, either in the early stages to keep mines off of their lands in the first place, or um, to have them attended to and the harms to be addressed all the way along from start to finish. And um, I, I really think and, and, and hope that this disaster will be a serious, provide a moment of pause to reflect on uh, this, this destructive uh, form of mining that, that Canada has, has really embodied and is promoting everywhere. And I just want to recall another disaster in waiting that maybe we have heard less about, um, but that is also here at home in the Northwest Territories and, and what the giant mine left behind. Um, this is a gold operation that operated from 1948 until 2004 when the company basically walked away and left um, the local people living around Yellowknife uh, with uh, 237,000 tons of arsenic trioxide underground. Just imagine uh, eight 10 story high buildings underground and you've got the sort of idea of, of how much arsenic trioxide is underground there. It's enough poison to kill the population of the world several times over. Um, and with the company having walked away, a very common uh, occurrence when mines close or are abandoned because prices drop, uh, market forces don't uh, compl you know, continue to give them conditions to, to make the, the kind of immense profit margins that they're used to, um, they leave the local people and the public uh, with the cleanup. Um, in terms of that, 
disaster in waiting, um, it's going to cost the Canadian public uh, at least a billion dollars just to freeze it, not to clean it up, just to hold it there underground and hope that it doesn't uh, leak and poison and kill um, people and animals living in that, that area. And there are literally thousands of abandoned orphan mines across this country. So we have, um, we're, we're creating potential disasters all the time. We have a legacy of disasters here in this country. And we have a framework for mining in this country that is, that is truly uh, colonial in design and neoliberal in intervention with constant deregulations taking place. You'll recall as well the omnibus bills that have been passed in the last couple of years to lift protections on the most waterways in this country and to limit public participation in decisions being made over their lands. Um, but I want to move a little bit to talk about what's happening in terms of the model that we're, we're exporting. And, and I think it, I try to share this reflection and, and we, we regularly as an organization try to um, facilitate exchanges between mining affected communities here in Canada with our partners in the south because um, when Canadian companies and when the Canadian government is promoting mining abroad it often says well mining's good at home you know the communities get along well with the companies and everything goes okay and um, so it's really important uh, for people to be able to hear that, that really the experiences are the same, that when um, these large scale mines are being set up, that there, there's constant creation of these sorts of sacrifice zones that are dispossessing people of their lands, that are putting them at great risk, and, and that sometimes lead to the sort of disasters that we see around Mopoli and elsewhere. Um, what we've seen recently, and so just to kind of update on, on where things are at in terms of um, the, the framework for Canadian mining overseas, um, Canada recently, the Canadian government recently uh, reaffirmed its, its commitment uh, to uh, the so-called corporate social responsibility framework uh, for mining overseas, which largely adds up to um, a dysfunctional series of complaints mechanisms that don't work, that reinforce a framework of permissiveness, of impunity, that defines operations uh, of Canadian mining companies abroad. It ensures that there is no accountability when companies are uh, implicit or complicit in uh, human rights harms, in, in the sorts of um, violent crimes that we can see associated with with their, their operations or the serious environmental and health harms that are also taking place. It's also a framework that fosters very insidious um, divide and conquer strategies on the parts of companies that undertake so-called CSR programs in order to buy off certain people in order to work with um, advantageous work through the sorts of divisions that they can navigate, navigate in communities uh, in order to control territories and enter into people's lands. At the same time as I think the CSR framework is used to really distract and divert considerable attention and resources here at home. Um, one example being the new Institute for Resources and Development that was set up at SFU and UBC with $25 million of overseas development aid uh, in order to facilitate academics um, participating in interference in the policies and institutions that govern the natural commons in other countries. Um, it's also important to note that four days after the, government, the Canadian government in November this last year reaffirmed its uh, support for the CSR strategy for the overseas mining sector, that it also, um, that four days later, it recommitted itself as well to paving the way for Canadian mining companies. Um, so it's not just that the Canadian government is hands off uh, in terms of upholding the sort of framework of impunity that Canadian mining companies enjoy, but it also is very, very active in terms of facilitating and enabling their uh, operations where they may be um, through a couple and there's a couple of primary ways in which the government is doing this and that it um, re-announced at the end of last year which include economic diplomacy on one hand which the government has defined as channeling a hundred percent of the diplomatic core to serving private interests overseas when we understand how much 
of Canadian foreign direct investment, which is the large bulk of it, is dedicated to mining sectors in other countries, that adds up to a lot more support for mining companies. And we've started to see through a series of access to information requests precisely what that looks like. Um, quite a notorious case um, of the Canadian Embassy in Mexico um, holding the hand of a small Calgary-based operation called Blackfire Exploration um, through the before until following the closure of a, a small barite open pit mine that operated for two years in the community of Chico Muselo, Chiapas. And we saw the, the embassy um, helping the company to get permits, to lean on the government of Chiapas to permit the company when it didn't have strong community support. We saw the embassy monitoring the growing protests and opposition to that mine, op to that mine. and then to um, to ignore uh, the complaints that were brought directly to the embassy uh, by, by activist uh, Mariano Abarca and others from Chiapas um, who came telling them of serious environmental and social harms, but also that there was armed workers at the mine that were threatening their lives uh, those, and intimidating those who were opposed to the mine. And then the embassy stepped back and ignored uh, when 1,400 letters, uh, Mariano was, was arrested off the street several weeks after he complained to the Canadian embassy, and 1,400 letters were sent to the embassy uh, demanding protection for that man's life. And uh, the, the Canadian embassy did everything it could instead of in calling for the Mexican authorities to, to protect him, they did everything they could to ensure the continuation of the company's operation. And several months later, Mariano was, was murdered. And still even then, the uh, Canadian embassy didn't back off its support for the company. It did back off, um, pressing for a full and complete investigation into the murder, um, but continued to advise the company on how it could utilize NAFTA to sue the government of Chia Chiapas for having then shuttered the mine for on environmental grounds. We see those sorts of examples over and over again. That's how the Canadian government is facilitating and enabling and holding the hand of Canadian mining companies around the world. It's also doing so through its very aggressive promotion of the free trade agenda and um, pacting investment protection agreements with other countries that enable corporations to sue governments when they make decisions that they don't like. Right now we're waiting for a decision on a case that's being heard in Washington. Oceana Gold is suing the government of El Salvador for $301 million for not having granted it a permit to put a gold mine into operation that it never actually followed the rules to get in the first place. It thought, however, that through its lobbying tactics that that would be enough to get the permits to put that mine into operation. When civil uh, community organizing and national opposition to mining in that country led to a moratorium being put in place on all mining in, the, in that country because of the threats to water supplies that all Salvadorans depend on, the company then turned around and sued. Uh, for $301 million. Um, that's the way that companies use and abuse the um, supranational system that's been put in place through now thousands of investor protection and free trade agreements around the world that really serve to ensure that corporate interests stick while communities don't have mechanisms to hold their right, have their rights be respected. But I want to sort of then mention that there are um, some uh, efforts being made to try to hold corporate uh, Canadian mining companies to account and to provide just a couple of quick updates um, that there are now five lawsuits against Canadian mining companies here in Canada, um, two that were filed in this last year. Yeah. So you'll, you'll hear more, because uh, Angelica Choc is here, so she'll be talking about the three lawsuits that are proceeding in Ontario courts against Hud Bay Minerals for violent crimes in connection with that company's operations in eastern Guatemala. But I want to mention that there's also now two lawsuits here in British Columbia courts for the first time. One against Tahoe Resources for um, shooting against peaceful protesters outside of that company's mine site in southeastern Guatemala. The seven men who are wounded in that shooting attack um, have brought a suit the, against the company for negligence and battery. Um, this is a spin-off firm from Gold Core, very closely related to Gold Core. Um, and now there's also another lawsuit against Nevsun for um, use of forced slave labor at their Eritrean operation. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that those at least will provide a modicum, a modicum, and, and it's important to note that while they may help us get at those um, pointed crimes that have taken place in connection with those mining uh, operations overseas, um, 
they, they, they don't address the breadth of the struggle that, that those uh, people are, are, are working on and resisting. I mean, around Tahoe's um, project alone, um, the people there are op opposed to that company's operation. The, mine, the, the lawsuit's not gonna get at that. It's not gonna get at the fact that that company continues to operate at Silver Mine in southeastern Guatemala, in Guatemala now, um, despite tens of thousands of people having voted against its operation, um, and, and that is now militarized in order to enable it to proceed. So, so there's a lot more to be done in terms of how we can support um, the, the mining affected communities around the world. And I, I want to just close with two points. Um, one is how much resistance is building against this model of mining and how much communities are starting to organize at ever earlier stages, recognizing that because corporations are operating in the state of impunity, because they're operating with so much economic and political support behind them, that it is crucial for communities to map out where mining concessions have been granted and to start to organize and to take decisions before there is substantial investment on their lands and territories. And so what we're seeing is a growing number of communities that are declaring themselves territories free of mining. Um, we can talk about dozens of communities in different states in Mexico, over 80 communities in Guatemala that have voted against mining on their lands and communities, several in El Salvador as well, who are starting to take sim uh, similar stance, over 10 in Honduras that are, are, are also organizing this, same way, despite being the most violent country in, in Latin America now to be organizing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that there, this kind of local opposition has also been swaying national opinion polls. Um, the, you've got over 60% that are opposed to mining in, in Guatemala. You've got a moratorium on all mining in El Salvador is still mass opposition to, hon in, to mining in Honduras despite the fact that it's advancing and bans on mining, uh, open pit gold mining in Costa Rica in several provinces in Argentina and major projects that continue to be stalled are considerably delayed throughout the Andes from Colombia on uh, right down to Chile, including Barracks Gold, somewhat $9 billion project Pascualama that is stalled on the border between Chile and Argentina, precisely because people have been fighting with all they've got for the last 15 years. And I just want to close um, recalling what the Grand Chief uh, was talking about in terms of how Bill C-351 C-51 is really targeting um, those brave communities and brave organizations that are standing up against the extractivist model here in Canada, which I think is very much the case. Um, to also comment on the growing trend of criminalization and militarization and threats throughout the Americas against people who are defending their land and uh, their lives against this, this mining model. Um, we have been seeing how, and, and, and what I think understanding criminalization too is total, uh, uh, an entire process, no? Of processes of stigmatization that start to demonize um, communities as, as, as terrorists, as a threat to the national interest. Um, using law or notions of law, not necessarily always the application of law, to criminalize them, leading to real burdens on individuals, their families, and whole processes um, to create punish, put them through punishing, draining, and stressful legal processes to create fear and terror um, so that they don't stand up for what they believe and what they value. And that this can, is also leading to targeted assassinations and justifying serious use of police violence against communities. Um, I've already mentioned that Tahoe's resources uh, mine operation in southeastern Guatemala is now militarized. There's a national, uh, the National Security Commission has imposed an intelligence project, an intelligence operation that was basically installed with the company's um, assistance uh, in the area around the, the company's mine. Uh, that's just an example of the kind of criminalization, militarization seen at many, many sites in that country where communities are opposing mining projects, hydroelectric projects, uh, oil projects. Um, similar processes that are taking place um, in, in Mexico. Uh, we've got also in countries in the Andes where the Peruvian police have now just recently been granted a license to kill where they have a, there's been a passage of a law where members of the armed forces and the national police are now exempt 
from criminal responsibility if they caught injury or death, including through the use of guns or other weapons while on duty. And we've seen up to, f just under the recent administration in Peru, 40 people have been killed, over 900 wounded, and 400 who are facing legal persecution under accusations that companies company staff or public prosecutors have made, including for rebellion, terrorism, and violence, amongst other charges. We're seeing those kinds of charges also applied to people who are fighting uh, for their lands, for their water supplies. In Ecuador, there was a community uh, president who was jailed for eight months this last year, and although he was recently released, he was still sentenced with terrorism and rebellion, a sentence that will seriously preclude his freedom and well-being in the coming period and that is a way of not just affecting him and the struggle in northern Ecuador that's been going on for 20 years, um, but really uh, it, creating conditions of fear amongst many communities in that country that are sustaining long-standing fights um, against mining, against oil, um, and a model that doesn't serve uh, their, well, their well-being. Um, so I just, just to sort of and saying that I think what we're seeing is an increasingly difficult context. It's not just here at home, it's throughout the region. Um, and that it in, obliges us to, to network better, to work better together, to make the links across these issues, and to be very careful and to be very considerate and to be very, very persistent in, in how we do it to see how we can really build stronger um, solidarity in, in connection with the people who are really putting their lives on the line today. normally think of coal as a good news story, but compared to what we just learned about hard rock mining, I'm going to change my perspective. Um, it's a privilege to be here and to, to live in Coast Salish territory. And I want to um, express my huge respect for the organizers of this event who um, you know, I think do a stellar job of pulling together the, all these various threads, <coughs> pulling together all these various threads in a way that some of us don't, I don't in my daily kind of work. Um, I wanted to say to the, to the speaker on oil who's left that he, he thinks that oil has a problem, coal has a much bigger problem, and its narratives are exhausted entirely. Um, so just by way of an introduction, coal, Canada is the sixth largest producer of metallurgical coal in the world, and it's the seventh largest exporter of coal overall. And a lot of the issues that were discussed with, with oil are really the same for coal as well. The, um, this sense of its importance to the economy is exaggerated in terms of jobs and in terms of rents that are obtained. Um, meaningful input to assessment processes is often lacking in, in coal development projects. Um, it's largely right now an export story. And the one editress is that there's a lot of US coal being exported from Canada as well. So I'm going to give a quick overview today of the state of coal in, really in Western North America. That's the area that I know about. Um, from mines, briefly, down to exports, and where I think the key work is. But first I want to give a quick overview of the basics, because it's often forgotten, just like we talked about with LNG. Um, historically, in the, in, today in the present day, coal is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. Coal is climate change. It's got us where we are today. Um, and in terms of where we're going, this is fossil fuel reserves um, expressed in terms of their potential emissions. There's enough coal left in the ground to take us beyond the point of any livable society. Um, as James Hansen says, if all the coal is burned, it's game over. So really, we need to keep that genie in the bottle because once the mines are built, once the ports are built, the pressure to export that coal will be relentless. Before I go on, I want to talk briefly about this distinction between metallurgical and thermal coal, because it's actually quite a big deal in BC. The first thing to know is that it's, it's all just coal. It's just a, changes on spectrum based on its properties from, in terms of hardness and volatility and heat content. But a few key points. Metallurgical coal is used in steel making, although not for recycled steel, just for new steel. It's essential to that process. Thermal coal is used in power production. Both kinds of coal produce the same amount of climate change pollution when they're used for their purpose. Most of the coal mined in BC is metallurgical coal, almost virtually all that coal, and it's all exported. We don't have any steel mills here in BC. Some in Eastern Canada, mostly to Asia. 
Um, there's also a lot of U.S. thermal coal exported from B.C. A lot of people don't realize that. And there is a little bit, when times are good, of Alberta thermal coal exported here. So if I was going to give this talk, even two or three years ago, it would have been much different. At that time, there were, there were at least 18 new coal mines proposed in B.C. Every single existing coal port was proposing massive expansion. There were plans for an entirely brand new coal port. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail on all those proposals, but if you're, if you're curious about this stuff in terms of the mines and the proposals and the state of play, the BC government puts out a very good summary report every year that you can check into. So, and that's the title of it. It comes out every year. The other place to look is on the province's Project Information Center website, which lists every project that is in the um, environmental review application stage. Uh, but on to sort of the state of play right now. So currently, BC exports about 48 million tons of coal a year, 50 million tons a year. And you can really sort of say that's a two to one ratio. That means 96 to 100 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. So if all of those proposed coal port expansions had gone ahead and they were all being used to capacity in North and in, in Ridley, right over here on, in North Vancouver at Neptune, the new port proposed in Surrey, Western Terminals, that would have nearly doubled our coal exports. Um, producing about 170 million tons a year of carbon exports. So just by way of comparison, the whole Northern Gateway pipeline is only about 100 million tons of carbon pollution. The Kinder Morgan expansion, 112. We already export, in terms of coal, that much climate pollution right now, and we would nearly double that amount. So um, it's a huge problem, but it's largely off the radar. But if we move now on to today, it's actually a much different world. S several of those port expansion plans have been put on hold. Existing coal mines have closed. And right now, there is not a single coal mine operating in northern, northeastern BC, the Tumble Ridge area. There are no coal mines operating. Many of the plans for new coal mines have been, have been um, shelved. Um, any, any coal mine that had been approved in the past few years, and there aren't many, has either shut down already or never opened. And a similar story has unfolded in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. where just a few years ago there were plans for six new coal ports and hundreds of millions of tons of coal exports every year, 100 million tons or so. Four of those coal port plants have been withdrawn completely. They just are no longer viable. A fifth has, has had an application for a key permit rejected. And the last and largest in Bellingham, the Cherry Point Terminal, faces increasing opposition, uh, including from the, the Lummi Nation. I think this is a great photo because this is a ceremony the Lummi did last year where they, they burned a symbolic check from the proponent that they had stamped non-negotiable. They're deeply concerned about the impacts that that proposal would have on their fisheries, their offshore fisheries. Um, so there's really two key reasons why the state of coal has changed in the past few years. And the first, obviously, is, is um, public and First Nations opposition um, becoming more and more organized in the states, also here in B.C., um, the second is this complete collapse in the price of coal globally because of the oversupply of coal and um, drops in demands. And these two forces have worked hand in hand as, as organized opposition has delayed all these projects, whether they're mines or ports, the markets have changed so much that those projects are no longer viable, so they're being, they're being set aside. Um, but the key question that everyone has is, are these changes permanent, or are they just cyclical? Well, are we going to go back into another period of, of um, increased demand for coal? And the answer to that question lies in China. You know, we've all seen these photos. Um, and my guess is that the demand for thermal coal, at least, is not going to increase, because the Chinese government knows that it cannot afford the kind of social unrest that's, that's coming out of this horrible quality of life right now. China has a growing middle class and, you know, like anywhere, people are, are becoming more vocal about not wanting to stand for this kind of stuff. You may have heard about this new, this recent documentary in China, Under the Dome. It's sort of the inconvenient truth of smog for China. Um, it's a viral sensation. When it first came out, this was supported and endorsed by the government. But after, I understand, in the first weekend, over 150 million people watched this thing online, the government banned it. They're extremely, extremely sensitive to, to um, their social contract right now and, and the issues of things like this. So, so we know that right now, every, every week, there's more news out of China 
uh, coal production declining, imports of coal declining, the impact that that's going to have on global coal markets and exporters, largely North American, um, and China's amazing investments in renewables. So all of those factors together are huge. And you know, this is one issue where, in some cases, in some ways, we're looking to another country to, to do the right thing to save us. Um, but it's not just China that sees this as, a, as, as an issue. Um, I know not everyone here is enamored of market framing, but I think this is very interesting. This is, this is um, a graph or a figure showing market capitalization of the biggest coal companies in the US, um, with the sort of teal color being 2011 and the brown color being now. And you can see the trend that all of these companies are shrinking. They're becoming, in some cases, worthless and going into bankruptcy. Because, uh, to me, this is, this is reassuring. It shows that you know, not everyone is insane and that we're not all living in a house of mirrors and that people realize that we're dealing with an issue of stranded assets and a carbon bubble and coal doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, some, of these, some, of these, whoa, some of these coal companies are players in BC as well. Sorry, this is falling off the counter. Um, but even if you don't agree with those sort of market framings, um, there's a wide consensus now that the vast majority of coal has to stay on the ground because we simply can't have a world that's cooler than two degrees increased Celsius by burning coal. This is a recent article from Nature saying 80% of the coal remaining has to stay on the ground. The International Energy Agency, no radical grassroots organization itself, says the exact same thing and has said so for several years. Um, so, so what does this mean? Are we done? Is, can I go home? Is the, is the fight over? Um, I don't think so at all, actually. <laughs> This is, this is, a, this is a, from a public presentation by West Shore Terminals, Canada's largest coal port and often the busiest coal port in North America. This is something that they've put out publicly. And the fellow on the, on the right, I think, is Al Gore, breathing fire. <laughs> I think that coal companies, you know, whether they stubbornly believe that the future is at some point going to be like the past or whether they realize it won't and they're desperate to export as much of their product as they can before the doors close forever, they're not going to go away. Um, and this kind, of, this kind of presentation reminds me of that quote from Upton Sinclair. I know the language is out of date, but it's still good. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And that's where we're at with the coal industry. Much of the world realizes that coal's narrative is dead, is exhausted, but the coal industry either doesn't or doesn't want to accept it yet. So for the coal companies that want to keep on selling coal, increasingly that means exports because uh, demand in the states and demand in Canada is decreasing, whether that's because of gas or because of laws saying you can't produce electricity from coal. Um, it's all changing. And so if that means exports, that means that BC and especially Metro Vancouver are on the front lines of stopping the increased or the continued use of coal because we are the front lines of exports right now. If they can't export the coal, there's no point in mining it. Oops. So. I want to back up here for a second and talk about this metallurgical versus thermal coal thing because it's a big issue. If you're from BC, you know that this is a big deal in BC. And for a while, when we started fighting coal, especially US coal exports, the coal industry here has talk, tried to talk about the whole thing as one big whole, one big happy family. We're all about coal. They've now started to distinguish themselves. Well, we're not like that coal. We're not that dirty US coal. We're BC coal, and it's good, clean coal. And we build windmills with it and buses. And don't you believe in windmills and buses? And, and on and on and on. Um, so it's worth talking about the two things to see how it falls out. I'm not suggesting you choose one or another as a target, but um, there are issues with both. Metallurgical coal is the backbone of several BC communities in the East Kootenays. Um, this used to be the case in northeastern BC as well, but those mines have shuttered now, as we know. Metallurgical coal in BC right now, for all intents and purposes, means tech coal. Tech is a, is a Vancouver-based company. Um, they're big. They're a big presence here in the city. They're a big presence in the Kootenays. They're a huge um, contributor to the, to the Liberal Party in BC as well. Metallurgical coal also means unionized jobs in those communities in the Kootenays. It means the steel workers, and the steel workers are a huge supporter of the NDP. Um, metallurgical coal comes with problems, whether they're you know accidents spilling coal into our waterways or releasing coal dust in, and diesel exhaust into our communities. And by the way. It's interesting how all the railways from the coal fields to the coast 
pass through every First Nations community en route through the Fraser Valley and the Fraser Canyon. Um, it leads to accidents offshore when ships crash into to piers and spill coal in the ocean. <coughs> Um, and metallurgical coal, as I said, is, ju is just as big a problem for the climate. And some people say that met coal and steel making as a result is a source of 10% of the world's climate emissions. So it's a huge deal. And if we're going to sort out how we live in a post-extractive world, sorting out how we deal with s steel and making steel is going to be a huge issue. And no one here is prepared for that. No one in BC is talking about that. The communities don't want to know about it. The government refuses to acknowledge it. There's no talk about a transition or anything at all. It's a huge issue. Um, when we talk about thermal coal in BC, we're mostly talking about coal coming from the Powder River Basin of the United States, a whole huge vast area of coal deposits, some call it the Saudi Arabia of coal. Most of the coal mines in the Powder River Basin are non-unionized. Thermal coal has all the same problems that I described for metallurgical coal, with one big difference, whereas right now there's no alternative to using coal, met coal to make more steel, there are lots of ways to make power without using coal, without to make electricity. So I'm not going to talk more about tech coal and, and their role as a corporate citizen. There are lots of things that they could be doing differently, in, in, including engaging in this, this discussion we're having right now. They choose to stay out of it. They may be choosing to disengage from the US coal producers, and that's a good thing. So, so what do we do about this stuff? What, do we, what, what are the, the ways we move forward? I want to talk first about mining, but only very briefly, um, in part because there's other people in this room and at this conference who know a lot more about mining than I do, and I defer to them on that stuff. But I will just say that um, when it comes to fighting mining projects, really we're looking to First Nations to take that work on and other frontline communities because they are really dealing with these issues on the ground. There's several good examples of First Nations who've taken on coal mining companies in BC. The most obvious or the most well-known, I guess, is um, the Taliban Nations fight against um, coal mines in the sacred headwaters, Arctos coal mine, fortune, fortune minerals. Um, post, in the post Lakotan decision landscape, I think First Nations you know, hold the key. And if they choose to, they're the ones who can stop these projects. It's also important to highlight the work that's been done by other frontline communities, like the folks living in the uh, Comox Valley on Vancouver Island, who've, who've really fought the Raven coal mine to a standstill. And without their organization and their work, that mine would be approved by now. So. Oops. So how do we, how do we um, deal with this issue of stopping the export of U.S. thermal coal, which is the big other issue we're facing out of, out of B.C., out of Metro Vancouver, really? Because this is, this is a, in some ways, a very clean fight. Um, foreign companies, non-unionized mines, all the risks, none of the benefits, with some very large, very powerful vested interests lined up against us. I just want to give you a quick overview of who we're dealing with in this case. So right now, West Shore Terminals with the Al Gore fire-breathing photo, the largest coal port in Canada, um, owned by one of Canada's richest people, um, exports coal delivered by the BNSF Railway from the Powder River Basin in the US, owned by one of the richest human beings in the whole planet. Um, one of the biggest players in the, in the Powder River Basin Cloud Peak exports out of West Shore. They're also investing a lot of money in a brand new coal port at Fraser Surrey Docks in Surrey, which is actually owned by a huge Australian conglomerate called Macquarie. So these are powerful interests with a, with a, um, with a real interest in, vested interest in the status quo. They're not going to go away. So this is an equally big fight, and um, we're up against a lot. I want to just briefly zero in on this Fraser Surrey Docks project to give you a, a sense of some other aspects of what we're dealing with. So Fraser Street Docks, so I should say last year, the, the Ottawa Controlled Port Authority here okayed a plan to export um, 4 million tons a year of US thermal coal delivered by rail through our communities of you know, Semiamu and White Rock and Crescent Beach to the Fraser Street Docks, where the coal will be loaded on open barges the length of a football field, shipped down the richest salmon river in the world up the Windy Strait of Georgia to Texada Island to be exported to Asia. Um, we know there's already a small coal terminal in Texada. We know that they're already contaminating the beach with coal because we've gone there and we've looked. There's coal on the ground. Um, it's, a, it's a crazy plan involving multiple stages of handling coal, and it's going to increase coal exports from Texada tenfold. It makes no sense unless you're a desperate coal producer knowing that the doors are closing on you. So um, 
so we've gone to the province and we've said to them, you know, we've, we've called on them to deal, to, to, to show some moral leadership on this issue, given that they say they want to export LNG in part to reduce the use of thermal coal. Here's a plan to export U.S. thermal coal from B.C. Can you stop it? They ignored us. We told them that there is coal on the beach right now in Texada in violation of their existing permits. They said, you're wrong, there's no coal there. Um, the NDP as well has been totally silent on this issue. So I could go on and talk about you know, how the federal government has, has responded to these concerns, how, how we fared in court um, taking these concerns on. But I'll stop here because the point I'm trying to make is that though coal markets may be in decline, the institutional support for coal exports is not. And whether that's just inertia on the part of governments or it's, it's a stubbornness and a, you know, their own attachment to the status quo, I'm not sure. But we're facing um, a continual fight from the government as well. And I will stop there. Thank you. Okay. We're running a little behind schedule, but I think that'll be okay. Um, I would love to take just like five minutes here, and if there's a question or two, uh, a very brief question, hopefully there's a microphone right here that can be used. Then we'll just take like a five minute, you need to stretch, use a bathroom break before we start the next panel. We'll, we'll, the reception will start a few minutes late, probably 20 minutes, half hour late across the street. Luckily, one thing we're looking at is that the, the Chris Hedges lecture tonight probably will start a little bit late. I think some people have got the time as 8 o'clock, where most have it at 7.30, so it might start closer to 8 o'clock tonight. So we're sliding backwards a little bit, but we'll be okay. So if there are a few very short questions, we'd love to take those right now at the microphone here. Hi, this, this question's for you, Kevin. Um, I, I just want to know, uh, Texa, Te Texeda Island, has there been any protests there about uh, the coal going through uh, that community? Um, what's going on there? Um, is this on? Yeah. Um, there has been quite a bit, and it's, it's been widespread. The protests, I forgot to mention that the, the Seashell Nation came out in opposition to this project. Um, folks on the Sunshine Coast, on Texada and Mesquite, on Vancouver Island. Um, but it's not universal. Texada is, in many ways, you know, a, a remote resource dependent community, and there are people there who are in favor of the project. Um, as well, um, Slam a Nation in Powell River came out in support of the project, too. So that was disappointing to us, but, um, but that's the reality. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yo, Gila Kusla. Gila Kusla, how much I look or look at me? Gila Kusla, Gilkame, Gilkame, Salish, Squamish, Musquim, Slewotu, Hatsalano, Nugwa, I'm Gesu Gila Gilkame. My name is Dan Wallace. For, um, Leela, this is actually for you. Um, I think one of the things that would really help people um, understand a lot about the uh, frack gas. Um, danger zone that we're actually in right now is to actually talk about um, the issuing of, of licenses and how many new drill rigs are being set up from past to present. Um, that, that's really important and also to talk about Site C and its relation to, to um, uh, fracking for gas. So it's really important that people understand the true numbers, the true figures to, to make sure that, that that's clear. Okay, I can try to do that. Um, we had 15 minutes to speak, so I, I kind of skipped a few things. Um, thank you for that, Dan. So I think in terms of fracking, um, if we're going to go ahead with our LNG ambitions, or the government's LNG ambitions, which is the better way to say it, it would require 50,000 uh, new fracked wells to kind of go in in northeastern BC, and that's about double the amount that's been drilled in BC in the last however long they've been drilling. So that's a huge increase um, in fracking and in, in wells that would be drilled in northeastern BC that, again, that area is already absolutely overwhelmed and people have been saying that they already can't handle the development that's happening. So that's for like, let's say, anywhere from two to five LNG terminals. That's not talking about 18. Um, you look at the National Energy Board and they've been 
basically just issuing licenses like it was toilet paper in terms of how much you can you know, in, uh, export with LNG. And so they've actually issued licenses for more kind of gas than we have, right? Which is really interesting. Um, and that's been leading a few folks to kind of wonder like where they're gonna get that gas. If it's not coming from Northeastern BC, are they looking at the Yukon? Are they looking to frack in areas that previously weren't economical because there wasn't the infrastructure? And the moment you start putting the pipelines to get to the tankers and you start kind of opening up certain areas for infrastructure, it actually allows you know, the development of what they call midstream resources. And that's something that folks in the Skeena area were starting to notice, because they sit atop Bowser Basin. So that's kind of like uh, Hazelton Smithers area, and beautiful, beautiful rivers through there. And they actually uncovered in some of TransCanada's gas pipeline proposals, this kind of talk about developing the midstream resources. And again, before it wasn't economical to do that, now it, at some point in the future it could be. Right, so that's a big thing. When it comes to the Site C Dam, um, which is a huge uh, mega project that people have been opposing in BC for decades upon decades, and Treaty 8's been opposing it, um, settler communities have been opposing it, and the government pretty much rammed it through, or are trying to ram it through right now, um, and it's facing many legal challenges, which is amazing. Um, in the beginning, everybody was wondering, where is the electricity, like why do we need Site C Dam? What's the point of it? And the government could never give a good answer. And sometimes they said, oh, maybe it's for the LNG. Other times they said they were going to export it to California. The energy produced from Site C, just basically one LNG terminal would suck up all that energy. That's how energy intensive LNG is. And so we still don't really know where Site C is going. Hopefully it never even comes to pass because of the legal challenges um, and all the resistance to it. But uh, I guess I hope that gives a little clarity to what you were asking. Yeah. This will be just one more question and then we'll... I have actually a piece of the puzzle that I've been finding out. I've been chasing LNG around um, whether Science World Tour did uh, Squamish, Nanaimo, and Kamloops. While I've been chasing them, I've been finding information about um, they want to dredge the harbors. They have to dredge the harbors because these boats are too big. I'm from Shawnigan Lake, and on Friday, we lost our appeal, and the, the Liberal government has approved a toxic dump above my watershed of 8,000 people to dump five million tons of contaminated soil. They just call it salt water. We've already got 40,000 tons sitting on a tarp that's leaching into our feeder creek right now. And as of Friday, they are allowed to start dumping any time. They say they'll be ready to start dumping in 90 days. Coincidentally, that will be my birthday. Um, I'm coming here because I'm actually coming to bring more information and also to get help because we need to stop that. Because if we can stop them from dredging the harbors, they can't get the freaking tankers in. So if we can stop the freaking tankers from getting in, let's do it. And my community needs help because Christy Clark is prepared to turn Vancouver Island into a toxic dump. And if this happens in my watershed, it sets precedent and it'll be ready for anybody else's watershed in BC. There's only two protected watersheds left and that's Vancouver and Victoria's. And this dump is 4.5 kilometers downhill from Vic or uphill from Victoria's watershed. So their watershed is at risk too. So I just want to try and connect with as many people as I can to get in the way. Thanks. Thank you.